Hello, my name is Terry Marr. Today we're going to continue as we live deeply in Christ and He's alone. Last week, we talked about uh, the dream visions that God has been showing me and the journeys he's been taking me on. And like I said, I believe that there's so many of us that are experiencing this all over this world and throughout. We have talked about the endless energy and the boundless strength that God has given to his people. And the more we think about it, once we've been on one of the journeys that the Holy Spirit takes us on, we'll see that there are those, the energy that he's given us and the strength is not for the things we really do here on the earth. We've got physical energy, yes, and we have physical strength, but endless energy can only be what he uses as he teaches us about eternity. Boundless strength is what he shows us when we're out there on the journeys with him doing the things for eternity. Everything on the earth is temporal. Everything outside of time and season and space is eternal. And God is trying to awaken us to the point that we realize who we really are in him. So we want to continue in that thing today. And I want to go over a couple of things um, that I went over in the first two sessions and bring us into where we are now. Now, as I mentioned in the dreams, uh, visions that the Holy Spirit comes to get me, it's during the times of of nighttime when I'm sleeping and I am um, unaware of what's going on until I'm actually with him. And I'm saying that because that has significance. Because I was praying um, just the other day and I was talking to the Holy Spirit about the uh, the uh, journeys that he takes us on. And I had get, gotten permission to be able to discuss this with the body of Christ. And I was asking him, it says in, in Genesis, the first chapter, it says that the evening and the morning were the first day. And many times as we see it here on the earth, we think of morning being the first part of the day and the night being the uh, last part of the day, and we would say the morning and the evening were the first day. But it doesn't say that in Genesis. It says the evening and the morning. And I asked him about that. And he was telling me that when darkness was on the face of the deep, the very first thing that God did, first darkness was here. And then because the darkness was here first, God opened his mouth and he spoke light. He never wants the darkness to be at the point that whatever happens in the darkness, that morning won't be coming right behind it to undo it. The evening and the morning was the first day. Keep in mind when Jesus died, he died in the evening on the cross. He died in the evening, but he rose in the morning. The evening and the morning was the first day. So we have to see that there is, even on the earth, The earth from that point on, from the book of Genesis, from the creation, from that moment on, the entire earth is never in darkness again without light being somewhere on the planet. When one side of the the, uh, earth is dark, the other side is light. When one side is light, the other part is dark. But it never, darkness never covers like it did before. And always the Holy Spirit is hovering over the deep. So when we, when we think of this, we see that this is a strategy of God. God has already determined what he wants to be done. And we are the light he was talking about. Let there be light. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Jesus looks at us and says, we're the light of the world. He says that we, as long, he says, as long as I'm on the earth, I am the light of the world. So as long as he's in us, there is light. Even if the sun were to melt, we are still that light. 
and we have to live as we're light. Stop living and be and focus on ourselves and what's going on in our moment. When in actuality, we were born in the flesh, but Jesus had told Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again, born of the water and born of the spirit. Water is like a medium. A lot of people may not be aware of this, but it's like a medium. That's why the spirit of God was hovering over the water, because it's like taking you from one form and to the next. A child is born from the umbilical of the uh, embiotic fluid of the mother, and the child comes through that fluid. And when they come through it, it's like to be, if they're being born. When we go through the baptism, which is a, a, a symbolic of that water, we come out as new creatures. We come back out as spirit. So what we've been doing, uh, we've been living in the flesh, and God is trying to make sure that we understand we came as flesh, but we are to be able to live and move as spirit because God is spirit. And we who worship God, the only wise and true God, our Father, worship Him in spirit and in truth. So let's go back right now. Let's go to the book of um, Ezekiel. And I want to read it from the Message Bible, Ezekiel chapter 1. We read a little bit about this before, but as you're getting this, let me bring us up uh, regarding some of the other things we talked about before. Uh, remember when we, I talked about the dreams that the Holy Spirit takes me on and how in these dreams I'm able to uh, go with Him and we're flying. And as He, uh, remember I said that when I came out of this, He told me there were some things I couldn't remember because I wasn't ready for them, but now He was allowing me to remember them. Shortly after that, what I didn't mention is that all of a sudden I started having childhood memories. And one of the childhood memories I had is I would always tell my family that I could fly. I always told them that. And they would look at me like I was crazy. And I just, you know, I didn't understand why they didn't understand what I meant. And I said that up until I got like maybe nine or 10 or 11 years old. And I forgot about it. I totally forgot about you know, that I had that sensation that we could fly places. And then when the Holy Spirit started uh, revealing and bringing things to my remembrance, I remembered, you know, how many of us have forgotten things that we had that childlike faith to believe years and years ago. So um, as we continue, we'll realize too, uh, as I said before, even though we may not have felt you know, how can God be using me and not, not be aware of it? He can use us because like we mentioned before, it's not based on our condition. It's based on our position. God has already declared our end from the beginning. In the eyes of God, He knows those that belong to Him. He knows those of us who are His. He already knows that. He's not waiting, you know, at the end of the, of the uh, earth to find out whether or not you're gonna make it or not. He's already seen the end of this. We're the ones who think that everything God does for us is based on how much we're able to give Him when we're, we feel ourselves falling into sin. We feel ourselves uh, uh, doing things that we know we shouldn't do. We're not as far in God as we think we're supposed to be. When in actuality, that struggle is from being here in the earth and not realizing that it's not based on what we do. It's based on what Christ has already done. Christ died for us. He's not crouched on the right hand of the Father trying to figure out whether or not we're going to make it or not. He's, he's not pleading to the Father that we don't fall. He's not pleading to the Father that um, we get our act together. He knows that what He did on the cross, the Father did it right. It was done right the first time. And because of that, He goes on from there. And Jesus is now on the right hand of the Father, yes, but He is on a throne in deep heaven. Let's read that. Let's go to Ephesians, the first chapter. And what do we need to start? Let's look at some of the things we read before, starting with the 15th verse. This is from the Message Bible. That's why when I heard of the solid trust 
you have in Master Jesus and your outpouring of love to all the followers of Jesus, I couldn't stop thanking God for you. Every time I prayed, I think of you and give thanks. But I do more than thank. I ask. I ask the God of our Master, Jesus Christ, the God of glory, to make you intelligent and discerning. Now, remember last time we read this, we uh, looked at the other uh, translations and it said, instead of saying intelligent, it says, I pray that the spirit of wisdom be upon you. And instead of saying discerning, it said, the spirit of wisdom and revelation come upon you. So to make you intelligent, spiritually intelligent, this is not natural intelligence, spiritually intelligent and discerning and knowing Christ personally. And how do we do this? Because our eyes are focused, look at that, focused and clear so that you can see exactly what God is calling you to do. That you can grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life that he has for his followers. Oh, the other extravagance of his work in us who trust him. Then it says, look at this, endless energy, boundless strength. And like I said, this is the strength we have when we're in the spirit realm. When we are doing the things God has ordained for us to do, that the Holy Spirit is guiding us to do. Glory to God. Let's continue. Let's look at this. Starting verse 20. All this energy, what energy are we talking about? We're talking about this endless energy. All this endless energy issues from Christ. God raised him from death and set him on a throne where? In deep heaven in charge of running the universe. Wow. Running the universe, people. We've got a Christ who is on a throne in deep heaven, on the right hand of the Father, and he is running the universe. Everything from galaxies to government. No name, no power exempts his rule. In the other translations, it says he's over principalities. He's over powers. He's over rulers of the darkness of this world. He's over anything that is named on the earth. He is given that power over all things. There's nothing he does not have power over. And what he does, he anoints us to do the work because we are his body. He is in heaven, in deep heaven, and he's on the throne. He is the head of the church, and we are the members of his body. Now look at this. I need us to really get this. It says, everything from galaxies to government, no name and no power is exempt from his rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of it all. He has final words on everything. At the center of all this, Christ rules the church. You see this? At the center of everything that's going on, remember, Christ is ruling his church. Now look at this. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. What does that mean? It means that we oftentimes are so focused on what the world is doing. And we think that the Bible says God so loved the world. Yes, he so loved the world that he knows some of his people were still hung up in that world. So he died so that he could release those that belong to him. We belong to him. And those who want to come in, whosoever will, let him come. But we are so focused on that that we forget that Christ is directing the church to do the things that need to be done so everything else can come into play, plan and come into, into place. Now, when we look at this, we have to stop thinking, when we say peripheral, you know your peripheral vision. It's what you see at the corner of your eye. There's a main focus of your vision, but then there's things that you see happening on the side. We, for many years, we've looked at the world as being the main event. That's why we cater to the world. That's why when the news report comes out, we take what the news commentators say over what the Word of God says. 
That's why when the politicians make promises, we take their promises over the promises of God. Because we as the body of Christ, we forget who we are and we see ourselves as members of the planet on the wor- in the world. And so whatever they say goes, that's what we do. We dress the way they say. We comb our hair the way they say. We go, we eat the foods they say, even though the Bible says the time will come when they'll tell you not to eat this and not to eat that. He already warned us what the world is going to do. But yet we just keep listening to them because in our vision, our focus is that the world is the main event and the church is somewhere on the sidelines. It's on the periphery. And what does it say here? It says, God's trying to change our whole outlook on this. That's not the way things are supposed to be. We, the we are, the church is the main event and the world is on the periphery. Let's continue reading this. It says the church is Christ's body in which he speaks, you see this, and acts by which he fills everything with his presence. God wants us to get this picture in our heads. He wants us to understand what it is he's talking about. We, there's an eternal plan, and this eternal plan is for his church. Now, there are things that are going to happen in the world, but we got to keep in mind everything we do on the earth, all these five, ten-year plans we have, all these things that, all these vacations we're planning, and, and all this money we put in the ground when somebody dies, you know, for a funeral, funeral or whatever, all of this stuff, this is, that's the, the plan of the world. When in actuality, the Bible tells us that the earth, even heaven, is going to pass away. When all this is said and done, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So everything that we're doing right now is just occupying. But in, in reality, What we do when we are with the Holy Spirit, he is waking up our spirit. And how is he doing that? Let's go to um, the book of Romans. And we're going to look at one of my favorite scriptures. Um, It's in Romans 8. And we want to look at it. This time we're going to look at it. Let's see here. In the Message Bible. And there's so much of this I want to I want to talk about, but um, I'm trying to get as much as I can in these sessions. All right, let's start with uh, Romans 8, and starting with verse 15, reading it from the Message Bible. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave tending life. Wow, isn't that what we just said? We sit around and we wait for the world to dictate to us if we're sick or not, how long we're going to live. We, we put that in the hands of doctors to tell us we have this disease and that disease. God bless the doctors because many of them really believe in God and they're doing the work of God. But it's up to God. It's, the word of God says it's appointed unto man once to die. No matter what we do to try to live, we have a date with destiny, but when we die, when we belong to God, our life is really just beginning. So it says our, our life, we're not to look at our lives the way the world sees it. The world thinks when they die, it's over. We know better than that. Let's read that again. The resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. Our life in God the life we receive from God when we are born again of the Spirit. Our life is adventurous, is adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? Boy, can I relate to that. When the Holy Spirit started opening up my understanding as to what happens when I'm asleep, how he comes and he gets me, and how we do work throughout the universe, how we do work throughout the the planet. I I don't I don't remember any more than he allows me to remember. But the fact of it is that the things that 
I can remember, it seems like it, in one night, it seems like we've done so much that night because when I try to relay it to someone, it seems like they're thinking, how could you have done all that and you only slept for six hours? Well, that's where that endless energy comes in. That's where that boundless strength comes in. Glory to God. And what I do when I go to sleep at night, now I look and I say, you know, I'm I'm like, they just said here in the word, it, I ask that question, what's next, Papa? Glory to God. What, what do you have next? Where are we going tonight? But he, he doesn't allow us to know any more than we need to know at the moment. But I believe with my whole heart, the reason he's um, allowing me to share these things is because he is opening our hearts and our spirit so that we will realize that there is work to be done. And in order to do this work, we've got to see ourselves as Jesus saw himself. Jesus was on the earth, but he would. we saw him walking with the disciples. We saw him talking to the Pharisees. We saw him reading, going into the synagogues and all of that. But we also saw him healing the sick. And we're thinking that he was doing that when he was healing the sick and doing that kind of thing. He was in the spirit, yes. But there was also other times when he was in that that vision, dream-like state that we're talking about. Remember, in, throughout the New Testament, it talks about how Jesus would say to his disciples, you go to the other side and I'll meet you over there. So the disciples would get in the boat and they would be on the water. Next thing they knew, Jesus had said, well, I'm gonna go and pray to the Father. Jesus had been praying to the Father, but while he was praying to the Father, or while he was resting or sleeping, he slips into this, this spirit state where they began to see him walking on the water. They see Jesus walking on the water and they thought he was a ghost. They thought he was a spirit. And it's because Jesus throughout the New Testament, he shows how even though he was in the flesh, he was able to move in the spirit realm. Think about when he went to his hometown in Nazareth. He read from the uh, the Bible, the uh, scroll, and as he's reading from the scroll, he's telling them uh, about uh, what Isaiah said uh, about the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and the things that God has, uh, the Holy Spirit has anointed him to do. After he reads this, he talks to the people and he says things that let them know they're not where they need to be in God. And that... Uh, he is not sent there to work miracles so that they can praise him. He is sent to do the work of the Father and the will of the Father. So they get so intimidated, they take Jesus and take him to the top of this hill and they're trying to throw him off the hill to kill him. But it says in the Bible that in the midst of all that, our Jesus, who was walking, we say he was man, but he was God, yes. His man is the the physical part of him, they were trying to throw off the edge of the cliff. But that spirit man of Jesus takes control and walks through the midst of that crowd. And as he walks through the midst of that crowd, they can't find him to kill him. They can't even find him. That is the what we have to understand. Yes, we are in flesh, but we are spirit. God is spirit. And they, we, his children, worship him in spirit and we worship him in truth. There's a whole lot more to where we are and who we are than we have allowed ourselves to believe. There is a childlike spirit God is after. When we go to the universities, and I have master's degrees, two of them, and, and I believe in education, I believe in all of that. But if you get to the point that you are so intellectual on the earth, that you cannot understand what God has planned for us in the spirit realm, then you have your faith is limited to what the textbook tells you, tells you. And God does not want us to be there. That's not where his people belong. Our Jesus is alive. He is in us. He's living in us. He's talking to us. He is the head of the church. The church is the main event. We are to go into the world and compel them to come. But even if they don't come, we are still responsible for the things God has said we must do. We belong to him. 
We are the sheep of his pasture. We are the members of his body. He expects a lot from us. He's given us everything we need. We have got to pray for that childlike faith. Lord, let us be who you say we are so we can live deeply in Christ. We'll see you next week. Hello, everyone. This is Terry Marr. I'm here to promote my new book that's out. God's expectations of us are great. Facing the fears along the way. This book came straight out of my spirit from different experiences I've had over the last few years where God has told me that he wanted me to do something and he just pumped me up to the point that I just knew I could do it. He told me the things that would happen in the beginning. He even mentioned a few things that would happen at the end, but it's the middle part he didn't tell me about. And that's where the fear was. God wants us to be able not to be fearful about anything. He wants to be able to face our fears, to trust in Him, no matter how difficult it is, how impossible it may seem. So I wrote a book about it, God's Expectations of Us. Not just me, because it's not just about me. Many things we go through are not about us, it's about other people who are watching us. So this book, I think, is going to be able to help you. You can get it by going to my website, carrymarministries.org, and click on the a site that says services available, it'll take you right to the book page. And if you can read that book and just pray about what you're going through right now, you'll see a side of God you didn't know was possible. God is there for us. God's expectations of you, they're great. Be who he called you to be. As a Christian, you may be aware of the journey of life you must navigate through day by day. But as a son of God, are you aware of the Father who has ordered each step, making it specific to your needs and his expectations for your growth and success along the way? Through Terry Marr's new book, Searching the Depths of God, you will discover that every step is deliberate and necessary for you to become the answer to the problems of this planet. With each chapter of her book, you will discover your role in this epic adventure called life and strengthen your resolve to please the Father while recognizing He is so much greater, powerful, wiser, and transcendent than you could ever imagine. Call the number on your screen now or visit terrymarministries.org to get your copy of this amazing book today.